Obviously, brethren, this is a very large text. It covers a lot of territory. Uh, God's working His uh, agenda, uh, His will and purpose that He's fulfilling in His people. It's His, you know. Uh, the, the Most High by this prophet addresses His people that they will know who's speaking to them. The Redeemer of Israel. They're a holy one. Now earlier in this record, you remember that they had told Isaiah, speak no more to us of the Holy One of Israel. <laughs> so the prophet sticks it in their eye again and again and again. God is not, uh, he doesn't back off so easy when it comes to rebellious and stiff-necked people, does he? They, uh, the fleshly heart and mind thinks that they can just stick their nose in the air and stick their finger in God's eye. Despite his power and his demonstrations of his wisdom and his might, it's a staggering thing to think how people act right in the face of these things, and yet we had the example of it that was mentioned this morning in the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. When these men came to take God's messengers for their own purpose, they were struck blind, but that didn't stop them. They didn't stop, they just continued forward. And the account there of the of the uh, the fifth bowl or vial there in Revelation 16 is poured out on them. They knew the source of it, they didn't care. They were going to rail against the source, even though, even in the midst of their destruction. This is the, this is the way of the ungodly and the reprobate, the one who's turned away and refuses the knowledge of God. But God sends forth his word, stating again and again and again and again what he's going to do. He sets the agenda and then he begins to unfold and execute what he has appointed of his purpose. The object, the target, if you will. He sets that target, he aims for it, and it doesn't matter about the wind blowing. Doesn't matter about any kind of distraction in any way. He hits the target. And he's done this again and again and again and again through the centuries. His word does not return to him empty. It accomplishes a purpose for which he sends it. And it doesn't matter if the hearers won't listen. Doesn't matter at all. It's, it's staggering when you think about the, the enemies of the Savior sitting there in his presence in Jerusalem, these men whose whole lives had been devoted to the study of the word of God, and they were so hard, they would not bend the knee in his presence. They would not yield their hearts and minds in his presence, even when he told them parables that they knew he was speaking about them, that they knew condemned them. And all that they said and did, they would not yield. They just set their foreheads against him. They set their stiff necks until they were broken. Well, God, through this prophet, he has given abundant testimony. He's their redeemer. He chose them. They'd given up hope again and again and again. Who there in Egypt thought that eventually God would intervene? And he would keep his promise given to their father, Abraham. When Moses appeared on the scene again after being gone for 40 years, they had to be convinced again and again and again. They were easily, easily drawn back to despair and were not willing to just stand firm and say that this is the word of God and we're going to stand on it no matter what happens. Unlike our brother Job, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. They were not, in, in, in the 
in the abundance and, and the, can, the accruing evidence, you know, the wave of evidence that just continued to mount up and mount up and mount up down through the generations and the centuries. Redeemer. Redeemer. Holy One. See, He does not change. He does not vacillate in His nature, in His character, in His thinking, in His wisdom, in His goodness, in His righteousness and truth. He does not vacillate. Therefore, Israel was not destroyed. And his purpose continued to be fulfilled then. The Redeemer of Israel and their Holy One. That's who's speaking. That's who's speaking. He's, he's not one to be drawn away and distracted by earthly interests, political or social things, economic things. No, these things don't affect him. Do not affect his throne. The foundation of his throne is righteousness and truth. And those things are not shaken. They're not changing. They don't move at all. The things of the earth, the things of this world. That's why the, the, uh, the Lord had to bring John up. Come up here. Called him up where he could see things from that perspective. And know that God and his will and purpose is not swallowed up, overcome by such things of the earth and men. It never has been. It's still not. We may have some satellites, you know, human-made things circling the earth. and We may be able to take a lot of pictures of this, that, and the other. We may even be able to do, you know, some pretty, pretty flashy military things and so forth and carry radio phones around in our pockets and, and, and you know, take notes on electronic screens and all kinds of, you know, have a library of books and a little thin. But it, heaven's not impressed by any of that. Not at all. I mentioned to the young people at Juby this morning when Jesus transported himself from Emmaus back to Jerusalem, appearing in one room and another place and another place. He didn't need any external machines doing that. He had that power in himself. In himself. Even so, the Most High has redemption and holiness in himself. And he is not changed or affected by the things that change and affect us. All he has to do for us is turn up the temperature. Huh? Or turn it down. Or cause the wind to blow. Or water to fall. And wow. <laughs> Everything changes for us. Just a small external thing like that. Or maybe even... You know, I, for the last several months, I've been having a little equilibrium problem. When I get up in the morning, I've got to sit on the edge of the bed a little bit. I had to get under the car last night, and it affected me trying to get out from underneath the car. I had to get up and hang on to the edge of the car for a little bit while my equilibrium stabilized. And so for some little thing, and you know what that is, you know, that's a little liquid right in here, right inside there, a little tiny thing. You probably can't even see it with the naked eye. And yet I had to hang on to the edge of the car to stand up for a few seconds, get my bearings again. So all, any kind of little thing like that, just a little tiny thing, you know, we know what viruses are. Little things like that affect us. Little infection in your finger there, right on the edge of your fingernail, you know, and you can't do the things you need. All of us guys who work with our hands and do heavy things with our hands and so forth, you get a little infection in your fingernail, and boy, that affects even the large things don't affect him. He's controlling these things. He's watching over. And it's a great comfort to our soul and heart and mind to know this reality. That he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. That he sat as king at the flood. It's a great comfort to remember that. We need to hear that again and again. You turn on the media, our current media, especially here in this country where you... You get deluged with, with things constantly. What are you going to do? Where are you going to turn to? Where are we going to find somebody that can straighten this mess out? How are we going to settle this? How are we going to settle that? Well, it's been settled. It's just working its way out. It's just working its way out. We've got to remove the dead wood, you know, the dead people, the dead thinking, the dead words, useless words, constant words. 
We have an anchor of the soul. Brethren, he is the redeemer. He is holy. And he is speaking to his chosen one here. And this is part of a myriad of promises that the Father gave the Son. These statements here. Part of a myriad of these promises. To the one whom man despises. To him whom the nation abhors. To the servant of rulers. And God's elaborating this list of things. He's going to open up for them this commission. We want to use the phrase great commission. Well, here's a place where it applies. Huh. It doesn't apply in the other case for the most part. This is the great commission. And the great one who delivered on that commission. Huh. And yet he's described here in, an, in a really, you know, this is not the way that, that a uh, nation would want to describe its ambassador, is it? <laughs> a little denigrating. You want to, when you send an ambassador out as a representative, you want to, don't you normally want to build them up and, and, and make that, you, you want them to have a really uh, impressive resume, don't you? Be able to deliver them in some way that, well, boy, th this, this is really somebody. From the one who's sending them and for the ones who are receiving them. You want to be impressed, don't you? Make a, make a good statement, a good strong statement right up front. Well, this is not the way that men would do it, but this is the way the Lord does it because he's speaking ahead of time about the way this one is going to be perceived in the earth. And know how he's perceived in heavenly places. He's the Lord of glory. Unquestioned. Unquestioned unchallenged in God's presence appointed by God himself willing to go here am I here am I he said but on the earth he's despised he's not highly regarded where did this man get this wisdom and his learning having never been taught or having never learned. Where did he get these things? The people in Jerusalem said. Or the people in Nazareth. We know this is Joseph and Mary's son. And his brothers James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon here with us. His sisters. Where now did he get these powers? Offended at him, see. Because they considered him just one of them. And it, and it was okay if he did certain things. Physician, heal yourself, see. But he refused that for them, didn't he? He didn't do many great signs among them because there was unbelief. They were not willing. He knew what was in their hearts. He spoke to them about it there in their own synagogue. Right, you know, talk about a finger in the eye. Stood right there in his hometown pulpit. read the text to them, announced that he was here in fulfillment of it. And for a little bit, there was some good reaction, but it didn't last very long, did it? And he made sure it didn't last very long. He spoke in a way where they, had, where they knew they had to make a decision. Things were not like they had thought. The circumstance was not like they had thought, and so they despised him. And they took him drug him out of the city or through the streets and out of the city in order to assassinate him, to execute him. We'll just see about you, Jesus. And he walked right through their midst. Now, we don't know what, how that, how that, precisely how that was uh, executed. He just did it. And there was no execution by them that day. Jesus was the one who executed his will. Huh? But he was despised. He was despised in Jerusalem. 
He was despised in Capernaum. Sooner or later, everywhere he went, after the height of his popularity, they're about the end of the, the latter part of the second year of his public ministry, everywhere he went, he was despised more and more, except for those who were willing to believe the testimony that God was giving in him. They didn't despise him, but the others did. They abhorred him even. They got to the place where they abhorred him. God's wisdom is such that he can speak ahead of time so that we will know this is no surprise to God. Whoops! You know, men would say, whoops, that's not working out like we thought it would, is it? No, it's working. it worked out exactly like God, how God intended. Precisely how God intended. Now, of course, the hearts of his disciples were broken because for a while it looked different, didn't it? Even among the people themselves, let's take him and make him king. Why, he's fed all of us with this little bit of food in a basket. Look what he can do. This is what we need. But he sent them all away. He just dismissed the crowd, took control, and dismissed them. That was not the way it was to be. He was not going to rule by popular demand. He was not going to be voted into office. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. God's kingdom works by appointment. Sovereign appointment. By the most high. Only. He does not leave those decisions. Those kinds of decisions to the people. He may let the people decide certain things. You know, a little bitty space right here about so big where you get to make a decision. But uh, not, not the primary things. He doesn't at all. Let them make those choices. He makes those choices. And then he delivers. And then men must choose if they will yield. Will they bow? Will they follow? Will they surrender? Or will they stiffen their neck and harden their foreheads? To him whom man despises, to whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers. He was, you know, the servant of rulers. He revealed things to them. Some were not willing to listen. Even, even in the history of God's dealing with men, some were not willing. Pharaoh was not willing to listen. Sennacherib was not willing to listen. Belteshazzar was not willing to listen. Even though Daniel stood there and said, you knew these things, reminded him, you knew these things that happened to your father, he listened. He sent out this worldwide decree that the Most High rules. And he sits in place, places of authority, whom he chooses. See, Nebuchadnezzar knew that. He understood that. That you can be taken out in a moment. And he yielded. Many did not. Jesus stood before Pilate. Said you would have no authority over me at all. Except that it had been given to you from above. Now Pilate probably thought Caesar. (laughs) That's not who the master was talking about. Pilate didn't know real authority, did he? All he knew was politics. Manipulation. Worming your way in to the good, to the favor of certain ones at certain times, certain places. But of course, what had he got? What had it gotten him? (laughs) It got him this assignment in this crummy place with these crummy people. Some of you know the, the history about Judea and how often the Roman governor would, would, uh, assigned somebody there that he wanted to get rid of anyway because he knew how he was going to be treated when he got there. He knew the trouble he was going to have managing and governing those people. And so often if the Caesar or, the, or others in authority in Rome wanted to get rid of some guy in a convenient way, they'd send him off to Judea and either the Jews would get rid of him themselves or they would cause such trouble that they'd be able to 
that, the, that Rome would be able to eliminate him then very easily without any embarrassment, especially if, if he was somebody who was a part of a certain family with certain influences and certain connections and so forth. You couldn't easily get rid of a person like that in Rome, but you could someplace else. Now here, here was Pilate, and now this. This religious controversy with this man who'd been in and out and up and down around Jerusalem for months, three years, some three years now, and here he stands before him now. And even when Pilate says, don't you know that I have the authority? He says, you'd have no authority. Now, now that's, if, see, if Pilate had a sensitive heart, he would have yielded to that. He was in a place where he could learn about the Most High. Cornelius learned, didn't he? The other centurion in, in Caesarea, or in, in uh, Capernaum, he learned, didn't he? He built a synagogue for them. He yielded himself to the Galilean, didn't he? Came and bowed the knee. Just speak the word, my servant will be healed. Cornelius yielded himself. Heaven testified, your, your uh, alms have come up as a memorial before God. Because he was yielded. He loved the truth. See. A servant of the rulers. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship. Of course, there's no record of any such thing when the master was in the earth. Not, not earthly authorities, not earthly kings or princes. But those of heavenly places did, didn't they? Angels served him and ministered to him. Principalities and powers of wickedness in heavenly places, they trembled in his presence, threw themselves on the ground before him. What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me, this authority and power said. They acknowledged again and again who he was, didn't they? Because of the Lord who is faithful, God was fulfilling his appointments and his commission in this one. And it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter how men reacted. Of course, God would, God would have his own. There would be those who would yield their hearts and minds. His word would accomplish. His word would find good ground. It would be planted and grow downward and upward and yield the fruit that God intended, the good fruit that God intended. He was chosen and supported by heaven in his words and deeds and, and those were the public seal of his authority. He cleansed the temple the first time. They said, By, what sign do you show us? He said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. And John gives us the interpretation of that. He was speaking about his body. That was the seal of his authority. This is what the Apostle Paul declared there in Athens. God has given proof of these things by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is the proof. It needs no proof. The resurrection itself is the proof of God's choice of him. God spoke this testimony, of course, of his own mouth three times. Twice in the hearing of uh, believers, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Later he would add, listen to him. And then finally there in Jerusalem, when Jesus spoke to the Father, Father, glorify thy name. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Many thought it had thundered others that an angel had spoken. Why God would not dare speak. God is too high to speak to us, isn't he? Surely that's what they thought. God's voice, God would not speak to, well, he had spoken in the past. <laughs> he had stooped to speak to them in the past. And he was giving testimony of this. Just as Jesus stood outside Lazarus' tomb said, Father, I know that you always hear me, but I spoke these words that those who hear may know. And then God gave that testimony when Lazarus came out of the tomb. Gave the testimony then. 
But Jesus works in truth and righteousness, wisdom, goodness, faith, hope and love that he delivered to his people. So he delivered those things. The disciples knew. The women who followed and ministered to his needs, they all knew. Mary and Martha, they knew. You are the one. You are the one. We've come to know this. And then he opened up even more. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he is dead, yet shall he live. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. Though they did not yet know the extent of those things. They just believed. They just hung on. Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. Though they did not yet know the fullness of those things, they hung on. They stayed around and waited until he delivered more fully to them, which he did. Which he did. Till he guided them in the right way that they should go. Which we don't know. But that's his business. He guides us in the way, doesn't he? It's his ministry. It's his work. No work of God ever failed by him right. or at his hand. Every manner of disease, commanding the earth, storm, food, fish, tree, and even... At the point of his greatest weakness, he tied up the strong man and took his captives, didn't he? Destroyed him who had the power of death. Destroyed him at his weakest point. Took the key, if you will. Took the key to his prison house. And took captivity. He didn't just take the captives. He took captivity captive. He finished the transgression. He made an end of sins, made reconciliation for iniquity, brought in everlasting righteousness, sealed up vision of prophecy, and anointed the most holy. He said after his resurrection, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. He worked these things in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. And then the end will come when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts all an end to all rule and all authority and power. He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. He's doing that now. That's the that's the process in which we live, the, the part of the process of God's will in which we are living now. He's fulfilling those things. Doesn't matter about satellites. Doesn't matter about hyperspeed airplanes. Doesn't matter about sending, you know, uh, rockets to other planets, those kinds of Doesn't matter about those things. God doesn't need any of those things. What he's working in us will not be deceived by such things. God's agenda in him was fulfilled and continues to be fulfilled. Remember? Remember the former things from of old? For I am God, there's no other. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. See, that's why these words are spoken in this matter. From the ancient, and from ancient things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. At the acceptable time. You all remember this text, don't you? This is where the quote, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, is taken from. At the acceptable time. I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. And he goes on and gives a description of the fruit of his work. Then, See, God's agenda. It's God's timetable. No man knew. No man expected. Why, he grew up before him as a tender shoot out of dry ground. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That place? 
How did this man get this wisdom? He didn't, he didn't go to our schools here in Jerusalem. Why, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, he's our man. He's the one that we've prepared and cultured and raised up for these kinds of things. He's the one who's equipped. This man, Nazareth, Capernaum, Galilee, he was the one, though. He was the one who had God's seal. God's seal was upon him. And so God worked these things in him. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? The acceptable time of God's appointment. The time that he chose. Who knew when the time was full? Who knew? It was revealed to Simeon, wasn't it? It was revealed to Anna. Who knew Mary and Joseph? These two. From this obscure, small village. This young woman. Whom, in the circumstances it appeared, was not so unspotted, huh? That's what it appeared to men. But God knew. Hail. Highly favored one, the messenger said. Yeah. God knew. Heaven knew. See? Doesn't matter what men think. Heaven knows. Heaven is able to search. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, fear not to take Mary as your wife. He was the one entrusted with the care of this boy, with his training, with his guiding in his formative years. These two, then, were entrusted with the sunrise from on high, as Zechariah called it, at the acceptable time. At the acceptable time. And in the day of salvation. God watching over and providing because he was bringing salvation to the earth. The sunrise from on high was dawning and bringing salvation. The horn of God's salvation is being brought into the earth by God's own Son, here's my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Hear ye him, the father said. His faithfulness, his purity, his righteousness, his holiness, unspotted in the earth as he went about doing good, healing those oppressed of the devil preserved to do God's will of course we know his enemies would have had him if they could have there in Nazareth twice in Jerusalem it was not the time the time was not for you it was not the hour of darkness yet he chose that hour of darkness let me remind you that at that last Passover feast they said not during the feast lest the people riot, but that was the time, and that's when he was delivered to them, and that's when they took it, because that was God's choice, even though it was not their choice. Let's not forget that. Once they sent to arrest him, and the authorities that they sent were overcome by his words. Never did a man speak like this man speaks. They couldn't touch him. They were completely enraptured in what they were hearing him speak. But when the time came, the enemy of heaven was allowed to do his worst. From which the sun simply got up and walked out once it was done. He just got up and shook it off recovered his life by the power of his, by his own power that was granted him from the father he just recovered his own life took it up and got up and walked out and continued then his last 40 days in the earth continued then to plant the seed that would be cultivated and watered in the lives of those whom he had chosen in the lives of those for whom he had prayed. I pray not 
for these alone, but for those who will hear through them. So the prophet speaks words of recovery and provision for God's own people in the earth. That you may say to the prisoners, go forth. That's what he said, didn't he? Set Peter free. Set Paul free. Had authority and power over all of those things. To give and receive at his will. To direct. To raise up. To open up. To protect and provide for even in the midst. Remember they were going to kill Paul that day on the ship. With all the others. And the centurion said no you're not. You're all going to jump on the water and swim for the shore. I represent Rome here. Well, not only Rome, huh? This was God's protective provision for his servant. Now, Israel had, had seen this provision in strength and wisdom. For generations they'd seen it again and again and again, but they were stiff-necked and hard-hearted. They're foreheads kept banging against the wall <laughs> and they just didn't learn just didn't learn there were a few but the vast majority even though they were of Israel they were not of Israel and God's agenda included a people who were not a people a people who had never heard who did not seek that's us we'd never heard and we did not seek but he had chosen us he has sent this message to us for us to hear. And it has increased and continues to increase because we're feeding all along the roads. In the pastures and the desolate heights, we're feeding. We're, he's providing what we need. We're standing firm. We're not swallowed up by the darkness and the deception that's all around. We're not swallowed up by those things. We're not content. We won't follow any other voices. We won't eat at any other table. But we will come to his. We will draw near to others who love the truth. We won't accept anything else. We'll sift and sort. We'll weigh and evaluate. And we'll take hold of that for which we were taken hold of. That's what we're doing. And nothing else. I declare your name to my brother. He said. In the midst of the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord praise him. All you descendants of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him. For you all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried he heard him. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's. He rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship all those who go down to the dust shall bow before him. Even he who cannot keep himself alive, a posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They shall come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. Therefore, brethren, let us continue to give ourselves to these very things. Yield ourselves to his working. His will and purpose that he's accomplished in the Savior that's been announced and declared to us in the gospel and that's been affirmed again and again and again in the preaching and the writings of the apostles and prophets in the spirit that God has done this. Let us feed along the roads and pasture wherever he leads us. God's grace and peace, brethren. Brother Jonathan will have our exhortation now.